Hello, good evening. Very warm welcome indeed. My name is Roddy Hawkins. I'm a lecturer in music here at the University of Manchester. And on behalf of the British Pop Archive and the wider university, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all here for this In Conversation event featuring Michael Riley, Linda Brogan and David Olshoga. The British Pop Archive is a very new invention, and I guess archives are always partly an invention, having uh, launched just this time last year. Over the coming years, it will form a space for academic research, public exhibitions, and conversations like this, reflecting the myriad dimensions of popular culture in Britain, with a particular emphasis on youth culture and counterculture. It is by no means limited to music. It includes, for example, the corporate archive of Granada Television. But popular music naturally provides a focal point and impetus for the British Pop Archive. Since popular music and its many genres are such a formative and entangled part of youth culture, to say nothing of popular culture more broadly. Placed into historical perspective, music as part of popular culture does all kinds of memory work, as everyone here will know, from the fragments of personal history to larger public and contested narratives of post-war British history. And it is the questions of the past and the present in Britain and of memory and of representation that form the backdrop for this conversation today. Our two invited guests are both working on projects that speak to these ideas in different ways. Michael Riley was a founding member of the reggae band Steel Pulse and then the Reggae Philharmonic Orchestra. Throughout the 90s and 2000s, he worked as a writer, producer, and consultant for numerous hit artists, as well as producing music for film and TV. Michael is currently a reader and associate professor at the University of Westminster, where he is also director for the Black Music Research Unit. He ran the AHRC project Bass Culture, the first major award to focus on the heritage of Jamaican and Jamaican influenced music in Britain over the last six decades. He has served as consultant on numerous documentaries and industry reports, including the critically acclaimed BBC programme Lenny Henry's Caribbean Britain. And he is curating a major exhibition on 600 years of African influence on British music to be held at the British Library in London next year. Our next guest is Linda Brogan. Linda is a multi-award winning playwright. She has been writer in residence at the National Theatre, Contact Theatre, Ashcombe Grange Prison, and here at the Whitworth. Her recent work has concentrated on the Reno, a legendary 70s funk and soul club in Mossside, Manchester. Her project, Excavating the Reno, encompasses oral history, archeology, span exhibition, and ongoing creative projects. Both the Reno collection and her own personal collection are now on permanent loan at the Rylands as part of the British Pop Archive. And she is currently working on a commission for Manchester International Festival 2023. Before I hand over to the panel, I'd like to make a quick word of thanks also to colleagues at the School of Arts, Languages and Cultures, the Rylands Library and at Creative Manchester for supporting the event financially, as well as to the Whitworth here for hosting it. And I'd like to say a final special thanks for our colleague, historian and professor of public history here at the University of Manchester, David Olshoga, and also to recognise the wonderful news this week that he has been awarded the BAFTA Special Award 2023 in recognition of his outstanding contribution to television as both producer and presenter. Finally then, please join me in welcoming David Olshoga and our two guest speakers for this event, Michael Riley and Linda Brogan. Thank you, thank you, Roddy. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Is, can you all hear me? Am I holding it about the right? Good. I always get these things wrong. This is what this is what comedians are good at. They know exactly how to do this. Um, it's wonderful to be here, and it's wonderful to get to talk about these subjects with um, two wonderful speakers. Um, we've got about an hour. And we want to leave about 15 minutes at the end for questions from the audience. As Roddy said, microphone will come to you. I'll remind you halfway through. Um, so please do think of your questions. But I want to begin 
just basically by asking you both to tell us a little bit about your work. I want to begin with you, Linda. If people who haven't heard of the Reno and the work that you've done, could you just paint this picture of what this club was and how you excavated these memories? Okay. Um, right, I have. I've gone really nervous and I've been all right all day. Right, so... Um, yeah, I excavated the Reno. It was underground, right, and then one day about... 15, is it that long ago? 2015, I was walking across the grass and it was covered in poppies and being a poet, I sat on the floor amongst the poppies because it was really unusual for it to be covered in anything. It was normally just grass. And I sat on the floor and I, I kind of could feel it and I thought, oh my God, it's under there. Do you know what I mean? And I've had loads of people say, because I write, to write a story about it but I couldn't possibly because the nuances of the stories would get lost in anything that I said and people would paint it in a certain light because of our colour, because of our class, because of whatever and, and and then I just thought I was powerful enough because of the plays that I'd wrote and the awards that I'd wrote, um, got to excavate it and before I excavated it though to get an audience I collected Reno memoirs, which is which are far more popular than the excavation itself. People love them all over. It started with just us lot loving them, but they're loved all over the globe. People absolutely love them because they just are so real and who they are. Then we had an exhibition here in the room downstairs for about 12 months, which was cut off by lockdown. But in lockdown, I have to sell this three Reno women wrote this book which is um, it's published now but will be launched in June so and that's kind of the final phase of it for me I've had enough and, and the voices in this book and the voices uh, in the films that you've, uh, you've, you've made, they are people who are brought together with a memory of this club that was special in their lives and in the story of Manchester. Tell a little bit more. And we have pictures. This is... Yeah, this is that Reno doorway. And someone was saying to me, oh, I want a picture with the sign. It was you on it. And I said, don't be daft. That's the point. There's no bloody sign. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's your quintessential black door. And you had to know about it to go. Do you know what I mean? And you had to have a certain vibe about you to go. You know? Yeah. Um, Michael. You have been, you're a music practitioner, you're also uh, an archivist and an academic. Tell us about some of the projects that you've been, you've been involved in recently. Um, well, where do I start? I think, um, just, just to contextualise how I've got to the current project, in the last few years I worked on projects that look at Profiling, much in the same as way as Linda, uh, the legacy, the contribution, the heritage, the history of black music in Britain. During lockdown, I was actually working uh, for Brent Council in London, which is one of the largest, most diverse boroughs in the UK. But we're talking about London here. And what was interesting about this project was that they made a claim that had to be substantiated, which is that they're the first borough for reggae. And it's a claim that was being made by the residents, the local community and so forth. And through researching the history of Brent, we discovered that there was something there. It was one of the first communities uh, for reggae. And it's where Bob Marley spent more time than Notting Hill. Um, Desmond Decker, you name it, the early artists were there. Um, Boney M, who sold in excess of 100 million records. The father of Linda Mitchell is still there, and he's 102. So it's, it's, it's hit, hidden, hidden histories. But then that was then followed up uh, by the project we're currently working on, which is the long history of black music or African con musical contributions to British culture. And this is an exhibition that will take place next year. It's the first national exhibition, and we're looking at 600 years of that contribution in different ways, different forms. Um, and that's what I'm working on, we're working on it at the moment. 
I, I want to get into issues about process, about how you do this work, both of you. But I think it's important to, to ask why, why it matters to you, why these stories, why these cultural forms, while in the case of the Reno, these places, why should we remember them? What is the value um, that we gain from incorporating them, them into our wider memories? Linda. Um, I was talking about this before at a coffee, when I was having coffee downstairs, because it kind of doesn't matter, because we remember them anyway, you know what I mean? And everybody who went remembers them anyway, so I haven't got a political reason in that sense. It was just, I just wanted to be vicious and bring them to somewhere that doesn't want them, you know what I mean? It's like, no, fuck you, you know, it was kind of that feeling, do you know what I mean? So... And within that viciousness, I wanted them to just exactly be themselves. And also, I wanted to set me free. You know what I mean? Because if I would... Because I remember when I was first doing, like, the, the memoirs, and they'd say, so blah, 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 and fucking hell this, and fuck it. And, and, you know, and I'd be laughing, man. I'd think, hold it down, hold it down. That's not the person who gets commissions. And then over the time, it was like, I was laughing more than them. Do you know what I mean? Like, and... It just set me free, yeah. I didn't know I would do that, you know what I mean? And it felt like an army and it felt vicious and it felt revolutionary and I wanted to do it for that. Not because I want you to know about my history because I know about it anyway. But is the, to pick up on that, is there a sort of double layers of forgetting here? Popular culture, youth culture, club culture are very often regarded as ephemeral, as things that are passing, things that have to argue to be worthy of remembering an archive and then when you add in that this is black culture which has been marginalized in all sorts of other different ways is there a sort of double marginalization here no because it's ridiculous because it's all marginalized anyway because everyone kind of gets to a certain age and they weren't young everybody loves pop music don't they everybody's got a club that they remember as being theirs Do you know what i mean it's not just serena it's wherever be you know, like, so, so, like, forget about that and forget about this and forget about that. And it's about, it's like a battle against institutionalization, not colour and not pop. It's about forgetting, all of us forgetting ourselves. And for me to be in this world, I've got to sell my story as a terrible story that I've been marginalised. But I haven't really. I've had a great time not being institutionalised. Do you know what I mean? And my voice is great and strong because it is not institutionalised. And when I was able to realise that, I've now been able to monetize that. Do you know what I mean? And to bring in other voices of other people with similar Yeah, exactly. And it's like, no, fuck you. We've got something to say. Do you know what I mean? And f but feel like outrageously, yeah, I will say that. Mm. Which was <laughs> part of the culture of the Reno, wasn't it? You know what I mean? That like you lived your life. That we smoked more weed than we drank. If you fell down on the wall drunk, you was a nobody. But if you could smoke 15 spliffs and walk out with your eyes still straight, you was a somebody. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, and those... And we've all got them different cultural things everywhere and in everything. But do you think there's something, uh, Michael, that um, I think when people think about Manchester the name of the Hacienda comes to mind very quickly. And I think places like the Reno have been forgotten. Very, I was reading uh, an account of uh, interwar London and the number of nightclubs run by people from uh, the Caribbean and Africa, which I'd never heard of, but that were attracting uh, playboys, the aristocrats, which aren't part of the culture, and yet they were hugely influential and exciting and transgressive places at the time. There is some... It does seem to be like another layer of ephemerality when it comes to black music and black culture. I'd have to agree with you. And I think probably the club, one of the clubs you're referring to is the Four Aces, which was central London. And I think what's important here is there were, uptown was no-go space for the African Caribbean community wherever they were in the UK. And so those clubs became really important, but they also were, I think, spaces where certain conversations took place that couldn't happen anywhere else. Certain overlaps, transgressions, if you like, of what was culturally acceptable, not acceptable, 
took place happened in these spaces. And I think what's important here is, I think, to understand that the culture is being erased in real time. And as, as a musician, it didn't occur to me until entering academia that everything that I thought was important that could not be forgotten, certain events being there, it's part of my memory, it's part of our memory, as you said, Linda, but it was just not present in academia. It was not in the books. It was not being taught. It somehow disappeared in real time. And it's, you know, being in Manchester and having, you know, talking about this reminds me of an event back in the 70s where, I'm from Birmingham, by the way. Um, I've just been in London a long time, which is why I don't sound like a broomie. Um, but um, we used to go to Manchester. We didn't call it Manchester back in the day. We call it Galchester. <laughs> right? Because of yeah, the... <laughs> <laughs> because, um, and it gets really complicated. Uh, it was because uh, casteism, and it was recognised that women looked different in Manchester. And we used to drive from Birmingham to Manchester at least once a month um, in pursuit of... I was going to say women, but it sounds really terrible. But it was, it was a Saturday night out, right? And we renamed Manchester. But that wouldn't occur in a book because it's culturally, it's community specific. And so what I find interesting, the history of that building is important because we knew about it. But it was not written up. It was not in a magazine. It was word of mouth. And I think because so much of our culture is word of mouth, um, we lose it. The impact of that culture, however, is forever present. And I think bringing those two things together really needs to happen. It's not just because we lose it because of that. It's because we don't dare to tell it the way that we remember the story. We don't, we don't write it down. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. Yeah, we don't. We, I don't know. We seem, to be, we seem to have been sat around waiting for approval. Do you know what I mean? And you don't need approval. Well, I'm not, well, I'm not sure that we've been waiting for approval. I think I used to be really angry with the community, and I'm not anymore. I realised that the, a big truth here is that we're so busy just working. We're just trying to get through the week, pay the bills, chill out, escape from the monotony of day-to-day -day life um, for a moment, and then get back into the grind. That is actually the reality. I think one of the things that academia has taught me is the importance of time to think, the time to reflect, to look back. Um, and it's not to say we're not working in academia. Yes, we are. It is. But. Which is sabbatical. I mean, I've 15 years off to write a book while someone else is digging a road. I've never heard the word sabbatical so I've never had. Yeah, yeah. With such an accusatory tone there. <laughs> All the academics in the room really felt that one. I've never had one. That's yeah, it. you will, don't to... worry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where were no, we? Do you know what else it, no, but do you know what else it is? It's what? the way that we talk and the way that we write and being taken serious. What I love, I'm going to keep going on about my book. What I love, right, about the book that the three ladies have written is, and um, Kevin is publishing it, Bloomy's Books is there, we had a long conversation for months about, do you not edit the fucking book? And Leonora, his editor, kept swapping the sentences. It took weeks, months. Because, you know, like, and there's this, a really famous line where Carmen, one of the writers, says um, that her wedding shoes are white, and then after she puts leather in brackets. Me and Carmen know what that means. It means, do not think my shoes was plastic. Do you know what I mean, right? And it took weeks for Leonora to get on that, that an authentic Mancunian or inner city woman will know what that sentence means. Do you know what I mean? But Leonora's trying to make us fit the system. Do you know what I mean? And that's what stops us writing the books that other people like us will read and what pay £10 good money to go, fucking hell, I remember that.
you know, as opposed to, oh, I'm not quite sure what that sentence means. Uh, well, I'll give you an anecdotal response to that. For another project I worked on, which was called Base Culture, which was the funded by the AHRC, I did 70, 45-minute interviews on film with individuals from the community. And I then transcribed the interviews and gave them back to individuals to say, start writing your book. And they looked at the text on several occasions and said, did I say that? I can't believe that I said that. And I said, well, you did. And they went, I couldn't have said that. Th that makes sense. They're reading back what they'd written. And it was the, I think it's the experience of seeing your words as text, as written down. And they hadn't done that. The other component to that was to get people to start to write was I read something somewhere, and you can shout me down if this is wrong, but I was told that guys speak up to 14,000 words a day, words a day, and women is somewhere near 27,000, 30,000 words a day. So I said, look, you've half written a book every day. <laughs> and they're saying, no way, but they agreed that women talked a lot. But, you know, it was moving people into realizing the power of their own words and seeing it written down. And I think we're agreeing on that. No, definitely. It's Agreeing that, there's a, that there is a, an almost internalised sense that our stories lack a legitimacy and a worthiness of being recorded and that our voices are the sorts of voices that appear in print as well. As Absolutely. And where does that come from? Receive pronunciations, the bathicles, academia, information, certain ways of speaking. Trevor MacDonald speaking with that voice for all them years. And none of us thinking, what the fuck are you doing, Trevor? Do you know what I mean? Nobody, it's true, I'm not even joking. Do you know that I, we... I we, think Trevor was born speaking like that. We've been conned for decades. Do you know how, how did Trevor MacDonald's mum just not stop him? <laughs> I haven't got a response to that. <laughs> can, can I speak about place? Because I think at the heart of it, we, we've talked a lot about voices, and that's absolutely fundamental. This is about finding a way, finding a, a, a process and a self-belief to take absolutely. these voices and make them real, make them part of a wider story. But this is also about place. You described your relationship to Birmingham and your relationship as a sort of like raiding party of young men coming to, Ma to Manchester. <laughs> This is about You're cities. never going to live it down, Michael. <laughs> this, this, is about, this is about place. Every city at every moment has an, has an ephemeral culture that won't last, but that means a huge amount to people. I'm old, too old now to know what the clubs in Manchester are, but they're being imprinted into the lives of young people at this university and in this city. Those histories are the ephemeral histories of cities. How do we make them as exciting as they are in our lives in the way we tell the stories? I think, well, that image up there that says Peckin's Records, for example, is the longest family-owned distributor, I think, in the UK now. The shop, which has now become a community space, was initially opened by, I call her Mother Peckins, but it's, it's Mrs. Peckins, because back in the late 60s, uh, Mr. Peckins and his friends were around the house at all hours trading records. This is a period when uh, Jamaican music was brought into the UK in, in suitcases. This and is Westmoreland, Westmoreland Records and Studio One and Studio Trojan. One, ex yeah. exactly. And Stuff I love. <laughs> <laughs> they became um, the main conduit for Studio One because Mr. Peckins was friends uh, with the owner. And the mum was so pissed off with the men, all hours of the night drinking, trading records every single day, that she went out and purchased or got the uh, license for, for a shop. That shop became the main distributor for all the sound systems because they control Studio One in the UK. What I find exciting about the space is you can turn up in this record shop today and you will find it's intergenerational. It's a community space. I was in there one Saturday and an old English woman that looked about 130 walked in with a cup of coffee for Chris, who was serving records. But what's smart about this shop is you can bring in 
uh, music on any format. It could be a CD. Some people turn up with a laptop, um, an iPad. Um, <laughs> so some people have turned up with their computer, literally a computer, and they plug it in. And they'll, there's a transfer of music onto whatever format you want. I'm not saying it's totally legit, but it's a transaction that's evolved over time. And it's a community space where the music still gets uh, moved around. But people just hang out for a conversation. So it's an important space that is now recognised by, where is this, um, this would be Hammersmith Council, who support the shop. And they recently put on an exhibition because they have some of the first promotional artefacts in the country. So these spaces are living spaces, living memories. And I think this is what's really important about them. Lastly, I would say that they're a community space. It's where the community's grown up. And everyone from John Peel to Rodigan was initiated into the business through this shop, through the network, and so forth. So that it's, it's, it's more than the bricks and mortar, if you like. It's where the conversation, I think, is consolidated and reimagined and translated and transferred to the next generation. So really, really important, as is the work that you're doing, which is digging up a club. So place is, is fundamental, and it was threat to place and change of place that first, if I understand right, inspired your Reno work, that the building itself was to be redeveloped. No, it was a really long process besides that I just walked across it. No, I didn't care that it was being developed. I don't care about things like that. It wasn't about that. It was, it was personal to me. Where was I my most truest me? Because <clears throat> just because when I was trying to be a writer, I just kept having this bang against the system. Do you know what I mean? And different kind of like ugly things happening. And then it was, where was I most me and also because there was loads like me there was loads of mixed race in there as well so not just most like me me but most like me racially me you know as well and it's just a long story that I can't be bothered talking about yeah um but no I don't everything gets built on doesn't it you know, I mean, it's amazing that the Colosseum exists. Do you know what I mean? That, that every space is just needed. But, but to go back to that example of the Hacienda, I mean, the, I remember watching on news in London when the Hacienda was being redeveloped, that this place, I vaguely remember going there once and only worked out it was there when I was told later. But it was kind of hallowed and it was sacred. I can't think of a British black club that has had that same level of veneration where almost like people are want to kind of put get the bricks of it. Um, there well, does seem to be a sort of a, a, a marginalization of these places, even when they break out and become the places where artists who become very famous sell millions of records come from. I hear you, but I have to challenge that slightly in that the spaces have been challenged, but they don't make the news. It's a very hush-hush affair. I mean, the Four Aces in Dalston in London is one such uh, venue that was, I think, original as cinema, cinema, concert hall, ballroom, so forth, that the community did challenge the council. It was a beautiful building that was left to just fall down, fall in on itself, because they knew that once it got to a certain stage, it was irretrievable. Uh, but the, the community fought it all the way and lost. And the council at one point was taken to court over it. So because of that memory that the bricks and the mortar held and because of what it meant to the community, and when I say the community, it's a wide community. It's, it's, <clears throat> it's where I think the Rolling Stones discovered reggae. You know, it's... Um, it's a special place, but because it's not written up in books, because it's not recorded in film, because it's not been made part of, I think, British uh, musical memory, because it's not inserted into popular music history, it's allowed to fall away uh, by the wayside. And I think this is a crime, and it's repeated across all the cities 
where there is a Caribbean community. We can look at um, the Bamboo Club in Bristol. We'd have a similar scenario. We could look at Rialto in Birmingham. You know, we can go round Nottingham, Leicester. We can go all the way up to York, places where the average black person thinks it's a bit too cold, um, and find clubs and spaces where this has happened. And so I challenge that slightly, just to say that it goes back to what we were initially talking about. If the memory is not considered important, if it's not in books, in libraries, in school, in education, it falls out of history. And then you can remove the space, you can remove the bricks. And then it was like it never happened. And that process by which these places don't make official histories of um, popular culture in Britain, how, do that, how does that come about? Because it is quite striking. Uh, I remember many years ago watching uh, a piece of film about the equals, Eddie Grant's band, on Top of the Pops. And I had never seen anything. I'd never seen that there were black people of British, carry his case, Guyanan origin, on Top of the Pops in the 60s. I was very well aware African-American music was played in Britain in the 60s. But the, I think the equals were an absolutely huge band. And they've been almost completely forgotten. Huge. I mean, but they had to go to Germany for their first... Uh, real recognition TV program uh, performances. And some could argue, uh, it's interesting we have a conversation, a political conversation around structural racism. Should we get rid of that word? And I challenge absolutely not. There is a structure in place that challenges how historically music has been curated in the UK. And it, it starts with key platforms in which you have access to this or not, radio, television, um, and even the performance space stages. If you're not allowed to be in those spaces, if you're not covered uh, in terms of the news, if you're not played on radio, um, it means that you don't exist. Eddie Grant is the first arguably mixed, multicultural, whatever you want to call it, band. Baby Come Back was, was, was the song. Huge hit of the 60s. I've never yeah. seen the documentary of the 60s that mentions Baby Come Back. Well, <laughs> well, and then it was recovered uh, by, I think, UB40, UB40 Pat, yeah. Pat Bantam. Yeah. But the, the point here, I think, is this is popular music. We like to talk about it, although it's something else, but one of the most prolific communities in the UK for music is the African Caribbean community. And that's because they have to be. They have to reinvent themselves every three to four years. A new genre will pop up because of the resistance. But just to respond directly to the question, the reason you don't know about Eddie is because he's not written up as part of British popular music. You could say the same about Winifred Atwell. Mm. Uh, you know, there's so many people, even Labby Sifri, why is he not a hero? Where is Sade? In, in the conversation. But I mean, you can equally, and this is what I think is worrying, and I'd love to get both your thoughts on it. I mean, I, I, I have been a TV producer for more than 20 years, and the, you internalize the cynicism of how that industry works. And I know what's sellable and what's not. And I know whether to spend a weekend writing up an idea, sitting in front of a commissioner. I would be far more confident trying to sell a program about African-American music in the 80s or the 60s. I wouldn't dream of sitting down with a commissioner to talk about drill music now. There's a form of music which is astonishingly innovative taking place in London and other British cities right now. It's only ever in the news. In, it only ever appears in the news. That's the only media it ever, part of the media it ever appears in, in negative stories. We have done no um, work as music journalists on television, and I know people have tried, to actually alert people to a form of music that exists in our culture right now um, that people, most people know very, very little about. So it, it's, it's not that people have been lost in time. It's not that Eddie Grant somehow slipped out of our memory of the 60s. That process of forgetting is taking place right now. Would you, would you agree? I would agree with that, and I'd simply say look at Top of the Pops as a curatorial platform for music generally. Look at um, even the 
programs being made around what has been recorded and which artists are programmed into programmed back into the memory of the nation through such platforms. And you'll find that you won't program something you don't remember. I mean, a most recent example is a band called Samande, which most people won't know about, but it's one of the most successful UK black funk soul bands, whatever you want to call them, that was recognized by Americans, sampled to death, and it's just in the last two, three years that they've been rediscovered. On the way down here today, I was contacted by someone who says, have you heard of the band Noir? And I went, no. First British black rock band. And these artists are coming out of the woodwork now and saying, we want to be remembered because of that. So it's a massive challenge. This, this work that you've both been involved in about trying to tell people that they, they can tell their stories, that their voices, their experiences, the geography, the places where they took place are of value. What would you like to see come out of that? Would you like to see Linda, for example, uh, Michael named a dozen other clubs in other cities that have similar histories? Is, may, is this maybe a template that you've invented that could be adapted to other people's stories and experiences? Um, not necessarily just about that. The template that I would like to happen is that we start talking negatively, is that we start talking about being marginalised, being whatever, things not happening, and just do it. You know what I mean? That, yeah, that just start to record the things that's happening, even if we can't capture what's gone, to start making it happen now. You're in a great position. There's loads of us in great positions. You know, that instead of going, I wouldn't dream of doing that. Dream of doing it, mate. Do you know what I mean? Dream of going to the commissioner with the idea. All of us should do that. But the strange thing, I mean, I mean, to speak personally, if I may, for a second, when I started writing books, what I discovered, and hang out with lots of other historians, is how many of the historians of my generation had parents or relatives who'd written books. It was never a strange idea. It was never this, my God, could I possibly do this? Um, they never really had to question whether or not, A, they could do it, but B, that their voice was of value. And I think, and this, I think this is where, where class and also race, also region um, um, comes in, is if only certain stories appear in television, only certain stories appear in books, I think subconsciously we think, well, our stories are different and therefore not worthy because they haven't been recorded. They must not really be worthy of, of recording. Is this not something which we super we subconsciously imbibe this idea that our stories, our voices know. are less? I don't know how old you are. I don't know how old, old anybody else is, right? Does any right? I remember in 1966, Stokely Carmichael saying, "Black power," right? And I remember black power. I would have been seven. I remember black power entering the consciousness of the world, right? And then the next thing, shafts walking down the road in a leather coat. Do you know what I mean? Like with, and I, I mean, like I've got a grey afro and, and we're not marginalised. And everybody wants an afro and a leather coat and a whatever because that we, we were talking differently. The fact that we keep saying this is happening to us, he's, he's kind of helping it to happen. You know what I mean? Like, to just go black. Um, it was cool in the 70s to be black. It was absolutely cool. You know what I mean? Like, so, you know, we need to... And also, we're still getting farmed, mate, as well, because when they come out, the, like, when, like even this, the way the question of this is formed, right, it is formed to give us a negative view of ourselves and for white people to keep buying three-storey houses with the mortgage that they pay on our backs. Do you know what I mean? Of the, you know, do, you know, do you know what I mean? Like that we need to start talking in that way and just know we've got so much power now. You know, like, and we are really, we, we can do it. We can do it. Yes, we can. We can, yeah. It, it's interesting you say that. Um, I'm just going to point to this image. Oops, it's gone. <laughs> just, just one second. This is Dennis Bavel, um, and I think this dates back to the mid-70s. 
And I contacted him. He was actually the first producer of Steel Pulse, but I contacted him for artifacts. And he sent me this picture. And he said, look, this dates back to mid-70s. It's a picture of him, whatever. The, 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 what's important about the picture is the guitar is holding. And one of the challenges with this memory is how we support the memory with physical artifacts. It's the difference between the tangible and the intangible. And I said to him, great picture, have you got the guitar? And he says, I never thought about that. I've, I'm sure I didn't give it away. He says, I lent it to someone. Anyway, long story short, about six months later, I'm still asking him, have you got the guitar? He managed to track down the guitar but it was based on a conversation about the Antiques Roadshow <laughs> and that. <laughs> and I had to go through this long story of saying, look, people bring things into spaces to have them valued. And this is a valuable artifact if it's associated with certain memories, certain musical memories. And it's the guitar he used on Silly Games, um, which is a wow. Janet Kay. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Long story short, he found it on the wall of a studio who hung it up as an, a trophy almost, and he lent it to them years ago. And the point here is we have to educate the community as to the value of their stories, as to the value of the items that corroborate the story. You dug up bottles. Um, you even found weed, you said. <laughs> Um, all kinds of, but that's evidence of a life lived, of a space uh, that allowed certain experiences to take place. And this is what we're doing. But, you know, I have to challenge you in saying that whilst we're trying to get on with doing this, we have to recognize there's a resistance to this. Even the community, because you have to understand the value of what you contributed, the value of the memory, and how you translate that memory into being valu becoming valuable in other spaces to the wider community. And because the distance of time between that image and where we are now, the community, I've been told not to use the word community, the African Caribbean uh, that have made this contribution tend to trade old for new. And so we lose the artifacts, the very artifacts that you're digging up. We're losing that and we need that to evidence we are here. We made a contribution. So I applaud what you're doing, but I have to challenge you on the fact that, you know, getting on with it is actually really difficult because we're fighting on both sides. There's also an absence here. I mean, if you read um, histories of bands like the Rolling Stones, the number of journalists, the number of people who are there recording, who kind of burst into their entourage to record, to film, to write articles, to gather material, it's kind of done for them. I mean, Keith Richards for about 20 years was not massively in the position to do much archiving. And yet a vast amount of that was done by the people who understood that this was a value, that this, this, this brilliant, genius white band working about music forms was a value. If you don't have those interventions, young people as musicians, if you don't have others coming in and saying, you mustn't throw that away, you must keep that, then there's an absence. Um, and when it's kept, it's remarkable. I was at the African American um, Museum in Washington DC a few years ago, and there's a lot of things to astonish you in that museum. But I have to say the thing which I took a photograph of, the thing that I was phoning friends about, was Lead Belly's 12-string guitar lent by his family. Now the fact that Lead Belly's guitar that he wrote Midnight Special on while he was in prison is in a glass case in Washington just meant so much to me. Um, and the survival story of that guitar is against the odds because Lead Belly didn't have many people on his side. Yeah. So this stuff has enormous value and I think we underestimate that other, at other times, other places, other, other peoples have help. Well this is the point and people might not make the association with Lead Belly and Lonnie Donegan and Skiffle. And it, it goes back to how history is written up. 
you know what you know and you don't know what you don't know yeah. until someone challenges that. And I think what the work, certainly that you're doing, that I'm doing, is challenging memory as it currently exists around the subject area. There's one other item that I just wanted to flag, which is, this is a map <laughs> that was made of, at the top, you can just about read it, but it's about popular British musicians' music in the UK. And you might not be able to see this towards the back of the hall, but what you'll realise is, it's, first it's very London-centric, and then you'll start to realise the absence of an African-Caribbean contribution. Um, and this very much represents um, my initial experience entering academia and trying to talk about the subject of black British music. We're so far behind the Americans you've mentioned, um, uh, the African American uh, uh, Museum in Washington. We're so far behind, and I think it's Lonnie Bunch, the main guy, said he had to go in and educate the community in order to get the artifacts to build the museum, to, or to populate the museum. So what you're doing is integral, but I don't want you to, I'm challenging you on the idea that it's easy to do what you're doing. I'm supporting you, but I'm saying it's not easy. But don't, it, I mean, the story of Lonnie Bunch in that museum, I know Lonnie, um, and he went, that museum is full of artifacts that people happen to have kept and didn't really fully appreciate the value of. Um, you know, I don't know the story of Leadbelly's family, but I sort of, I don't know whether Leadbelly's family would presume that this British Nigerian guy would be stopped in his tracks by Leadbelly's guitar in a glass case. I don't think they fully got that. Many years ago I went to, I was in Kingston and I was, went to Prince Buster's shop and Prince Buster was there. And I remember going on and on at him, like, like over the top fanboy. And I remember th half of realizing, he's going, why is this British guy <laughs> banging on about music I made 30 years ago? Because I don't think he appreciated um, that his music was of the value that it was, even someone as famous and as influential as him. Um, but that museum was only possible because of people like you, Linda, who Lonnie could go to and say, where's the stories, where's the voices, where's the stuff? So it, there is a kind of foundational level that is necessary for those museum projects. Very notable, we don't have a museum like that. But um, it is, it was built on the back of work like yours. Yeah. I'd like to ask a question though. Some of the artifacts you mentioned finding, I'm wondering what they, <laughs> why there was clothes. Um, <laughs> all the items you mentioned. Yeah, I you, don't know. What was that doing? It's as though people left naked almost. Yeah, possibly. Yeah, I don't know. Fifteen spliffs, it's very easy, <laughs> easy to imagine. It could happen, yeah. The one that I love is the makeup. It's so yeah. typical of a club, you know, to find makeup. I just, I loved finding the makeup. But yeah. this is years, like several decades after the building was knocked down. It was knocked down in 86 and we excavated it in 2017. I can't add up however many years that is. Don't, don't look at me for maths. Yeah, yeah. However many <laughs> Ask years. Ask me a history one. Yeah, however many years that was in between. Yeah. Do you know what as well? Alima wants, wants to take some stuff to the British Library, so I'm going, oh, yeah, yeah, get in touch with Matt, you know, British thing. And then when I the thought of it leaving Manchester, I, I didn't know, it's because it's priceless. It is as priceless as a mummy. Do you know, like, the, the dice out of the gambling room mm. cannot be lost. Do you, know, do you know what I mean? It's like, oh, yeah. You sound like a curator. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's oh, a good no, thing or a bad thing. I'll be sounding like Trevor McDonald. Yeah. I'll have a posh Creeping voice. Creeping institutionalisation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've, I've trespassed on the time that I promised yeah. the audience for questions. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to take a, take a mic. Um, should we do it with one mic? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll, actually, I'm going to need this one. So please, um, questions. Please raise your hand and wait for the mic. We can share one. There's a question here at the front. We can share one. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I'm from Liverpool, which is another story in itself, or at least that's where I am at the moment. But actually, it's challenging the idea that if we're saying we have to validate in what effectively is a Western notion of how we record things, 
is that not just, if you like, staying within the Western mood? I am also dual nationality, I'm Nigerian. A lot of our history is oral history, but the issue here is that if we have to evidence everything, we might be losing some of that um, non-material non -material culture that is really orality. And I think for me, it's as important to record those histories from um, our elders, so to speak. But I mean, I, obviously, I mean, I'm playing the devil's advocate. If, if you don't have the physical, it's difficult to do that. But, you know, I mean, places like Mali, they've got long histories of oral culture, which um, I guess I'd like you all to comment about, particularly Linda. About the oral history? Yeah. I think you can do both. I, I get your point, though. I'll tell you why I get your point. is because the reason that the institution and things work is because it's all quite anal, in it? And everybody watches everything. Do you know what I mean? And you set about collecting, and it takes something away. You know what I mean? Like bo body language and thing, and oral history and body language, they go together, don't they? And you, you work up a... Think, you know, like, like the, we was on the phone one way, it's like first thing in the morning, and then the next thing was like loud and shouting, and you know, like laughing, and you know, like that a sort of thing. We and we didn't even know each other, did we? You know, like so there is that, but I think you can do both, but do both naturally. I don't think you could wait, stood beside Lead Belly for his guitar to fall out of his hand as he dies. Do you know what I mean? But, Standing beside Diddle Ed Belly was traditionally a dangerous <laughs> but, place to be. <laughs> but I think what makes it so sweet is because it is so rare. Do you know what I mean? To come across rare. Like we found one of um, Persian's rubbers. It might have been yours. You know, like the rubber off the turntable. Even we found one of them in the digger. I mean, like, so we found weed, makeup and a turntable rubber. I mean, like, that's like someone putting them there, in it? You know, but like, but the rarity of that, but just to go around just putting people's socks, you know, in case they're going to dead tomorrow, you can't do that. And But to tell stories, but going back to to tell stories the way we tell stories. You know, like, my dad was a great storyteller and he would wait, make you wait for the, the punchline. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, like, and because he's your dad, you know what I'm saying? You've got to give him respect. So the punchline could be half an hour later, you know, when he's finished doing whatever with his pipe and looking at you from the side and all that. But, you know, and all those are cultural. All those are things we recognise, aren't they? I'm the Irish mum. Do you know what I mean? Like, she couldn't say a normal sentence. She had to, it had to be a a flowery sentence, <laughs> you know. She was a, and they used to have combats about whose story was good, you know, like sort of secret, like, don't listen to him. She'd say, don't listen to him. And he'd have a great way of like stopping the conversation with his pipe to ruin hers, you know. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? All of that is part of it, though, isn't it? Thanks for that. I'll just. <laughs> Go on, sorry. I'll just. Um, <laughs> I'm going to add to that. Um, one of the projects I did, just to respond directly to what you asked, we, and this is the, actually the Brent project, we spoke to people and we said, look, we're going to ask you to go out and collect your own memories. And we used um, the technology in their pockets, iPhones, um, uh, Android phones, and we educated everyone that turned up to go out and collect the memories in the house. And then we brought those back and we digitized and we transcribed those and we put them in the local library. And once people realized that there was interest in their own stories, they continued doing that. So I totally agree with you. Um, but as Linda's saying, it's, I think both processes uh, need to happen. And, and we're playing a game of catch up. What COVID told us is that we're losing those memories at a rate that we can't afford and we cannot connect want to have the conversation with the dead to be very crude so we have to go and gather those memories as quickly as possible because it's of a period that is really crucial uh, to the story that we're trying to tell there's a question here a question here at the front if we can get a mic uh thank you for that i have a i have two questions 
One is about um, care, because uh, I guess a lot of these conversations is about you know preserving memories and care. Uh, but I think the challenge comes when, especially for your work, Linda, the memoirs are very personal. Um, and I was wondering how you worked through care, particularly in the context of a museum space. And I'm speaking because quite a lot of the time, working with oral histories, having to be like, I guess, keeping certain moments private and knowing how certain histories might be in conversation with multiple different audiences. So I'm kind of interested in how you kind of work through care. And then I have another question, which is about history, just in general, because I'm a historian. Um, and working with a lot of young people, uh, there's this idea of history is a place where people die. Um, and I, I, I just wanted to understand a little bit more about how, I guess, both of you have approached uh, programs, projects uh, that's in conversation with young people today. Um, and what are some of the challenges? I'm thinking particularly around the new technologies, social media, et cetera, et cetera, when thinking about recording and memory. Hopefully okay. that makes sense. <laughs> think, um, and by the way, this is uh, Alima Graham on work, who's the lead curator at the British Library for the National Exhibition on Black British Music. Thanks. So I'm going to hand it. <laughs> so, the, so the question about care and oral histories and, um, uh, I guess, duty of care. I didn't show any... <laughs> I didn't show any whatsoever. I just, I used to start with, tell me about your first night down the Reno, right? And that would last about five seconds. And then they would just roll a coaster wherever they wanted to go. And then sometimes I'd laugh, sometimes I'd go, no, tell me more about that. Do you know what I mean? And things, and then I just put them up. And then nosiness of everybody else just watched them. Nobody's ever come back and done anything bad because of them or anything like that. So I didn't do anything. The second part about children, I would not mess with because of that duty of care. Because I'm an older person and I'm not in, they've got, we're talking with our life in the past and they're talking with their life to come up. And that does need a duty of care. Do you know what I mean? So. I wouldn't work with them and I don't want to know. And they live in their time now. Do you know what I mean? And we're free to say whatever we want to say now because we've had that young. Because we know we were cool. We also know it was torturous in the Reno, man. It was absolute fucking torture. No, because all the cool... My worst moment, right, is I wasn't a huge, great... Building a spliff was an art form, right? And I wasn't particularly good. So, like, I built this spliff and we're all... And everyone's laughing and everyone's doing whatever. And my roach came out on my lip. This is, like, kill your fucking self time. Do you know what I mean? So, we, but we're now 60-odd. So, when we're talking to each other in these memoirs, we're laughing about that. If you was 21, you wouldn't find that funny. That's the duty of care. You know, do you know what? No, but it is, it is, because that could really do for you. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I might have to push back slightly on that. Um, Michael, your thoughts? Uh, in working with younger people, we have uh, ethics, which within academia is, is really hardcore. Um, we have to decide where we interview someone. We have to make sure there's, uh, if they're uh, below 16, and sometimes right up to 18, we have to make sure there's an adult present. We have to decide whether we can enter the house, whether we're interviewing them in a, a neutral space or we're bringing them onto campus, onto university. There's a lot of protocol to protect the young individual um, involved. And also, we understand exactly what you're saying in that we're telling them or communicating or sharing our experiences um, which we're able to deal with but they might not and also there's an unpredictable element when talking to young people in terms of what do they know what do they understand what can they process even when asking them certain questions 
And so it's, it becomes very targeted um, in terms of what are you hoping to achieve by talking to a young person or a young group of individuals. And we have to work out what that objective is and be absolutely confident about that before engaging with them. But they're a key part of the conversation, I would say. And what we're trying to do is have an intergenerational conversation. Thank you. I, I want to try and get a few more questions as quickly as we can. So um, if, we, if we could. Sir. Um, I wanted to ask um, between Mike, Mikkel and um, Linda um, that uh, we're coming up to, well, in May 25th is going to be third year since George Floyd passed, well, was murdered. And do you think that um, we as black people have been dragged into being more visible since that time as a kind of repost globally of the, what, where we can see, well, within the UK, institutional racism? Because of time? <laughs> I'd say yes is a short answer. It's a yes and no. We've become more visible and at the same time more invisible. And I'm not sure I've got time to go into that, but it's a duality here. We've become visible and it's made certain systems, certain structures uh, concerned as how it impacts on their bottom line. That's what's happened. And there's been various reactions because of that. And because of that, we're becoming more invisible. The system has found ways to react to um, making sure it doesn't hurt their bottom line. So it's a yes and a no all at the same time. Linda? I would ask you that question. What do you think about what you've just said? What's your... You who've asked the question, what do you think? We'll just, we'll just return the mic to you, sir. <clears throat> Well, I, I think definitely because I've never had any more calls to join the institution since after George Floyd, as I'm a black artist, um, I'm a music survivor within Manchester and such. And um, the other thing which is noticeable, which is maybe small, I've never seen so many black actors on adverts in TV in my life. So, you know, and, and this is monetizing uh, thing so is I I I I think are the two just a a coincidence or is it a purposeful kind of um, act to give a different vision of the world or to say we're not this such and such but obviously we see we have a government we've got racist <laughs> in in parliament I don't care and such and such. We've got police questioning themselves, even to the NHS, which is staffed by many black people and been supported by black people, questioning itself over, you know, um, institutionalised racism and such. So um, one of the things I, I wanted to say was within music, we've always been very visible. And also when we get asked as black people, it's the first thing that comes up, you know what I mean? Because that's something that we do has been done naturally over the years and something that has permeated lots of communities and such. But I just wanted to ask, do, do you think that behind that there was a, a surge after the George Floyd incident? Thank you, thank you. And um, we have a question, lady in the third row, we'll just get a mic to you. Hi, my name is Anita Greenhill. I, I work here at Manchester University, but I'm also working in Manchester music scene. So my question is more about, um, well, Manchester at the moment seems to be with performance spaces. There's a, there's a change in the city. So it's becoming a bit corporatised. So, you know, l large popularist venues in town, everything else being pushed out into these community type centres or private businesses. But the new models of a lot of these community organisations are now kicks, which often are, you know, hidden companies of various three or four people. So the community organisations are changing. So from your experience, these historical buildings that all this performance has happened, I wonder what you can say now for the, the, the music scene in Manchester for black people. This separation seems to be a more corporatisation, so you're... you're 
your map of, of who is going to be big in the music scene is going to be more reproduced because if, if we have more sanitised spaces, the black community gets pushed further out, these spaces are also a bit more controlled. So, you know, there was more, obviously much more uh, different at those times. So I wonder if you could do a comparison of now and then. Well, the interesting thing about the map, which is not my map, by the way, I just found it, is it corroborates a narrative. I, I could have put another image, which f was from The Guardian 2002, when it, it created a, a map, kind of infographic map of British popular music. And the only black music on it was hip hop from America. And so it, I hear what you're saying, but it's, if to pull the two questions together, post George Floyd, there is a recognition of what ought to be done, but there's also a reaction to doing it. And there's a cost to doing it. And it, we're in an industry that looks at the bottom line every single time and it drives what happens next. But just very briefly, there's content that you won't know about. I mean, there was recent research in America that identified black males, for example, 50% uh, more likely to get prostate cancer than white males. Researchers then went on to look at musicians and they said black musicians are more likely to get prostate cancer. They then did more research and they said jazz musicians, black jazz musicians, are at the top of the tree to get prostate cancer. This is post-COVID looking at what happened to black folk in America. The point is, there are positives that came out of that and there are negatives. And the bottom line says, what do we do about it? And if the cost is such that it's, it's a major challenge, very little gets done. Thank you. I think we've got time for one more question if there's a, there's a, a lady at the back there. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, I just wanted to ask um, the panelists, what advice would you give to a young person who's thinking about starting their own project or curating their own project, maybe having some kind of doubts, like um, Linda said, like we're not marginalized, like just do it. But like, how would you expand on that if somebody came to you directly and said, I've got this idea, but I don't know where to go from here? Go to an institution, go to someone who is professing to be liberal and doing shit. I went to, I, I went to the Manchester Museum when I first, it didn't end up going there, but when I first thought I'm going to dig up the Reno, I've just thought, right, I'm going to dig up the Reno, I'm going to do it. And then how I do things is I went out that day and went asking people shit. And I went to Manchester Museum and I spoke to Brian Sitch. And even though nothing happened at the Manchester Museum, it consolidated that I had someone worth talking to, you know, talking about. And then we had loads of meetings where he would listen to me and make suggestions and that helped to strengthen it. So go and talk to Brian Sitch to begin with. Thank and you. if he says go away, say, well, send me somewhere. Do you know, like, if it's not you, give me another name. Thanks. Thank you. Any thoughts, Michael? Please. Uh, yep, I agree with Linda. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Um, don't wait and don't expect the support that you think you will get. It's like, um, be confident that you're onto something and be prepared to pursue it regardless of the lack of support. But I agree with Linda. On that, Thank I'm afraid we have, we have to wrap up. We've, I've trespassed on 10 minutes extra of your time. I hope you can forgive me. Please join me in thanking my panelists, Linda Brogan and Michael Wiley. Thank you.